Hey folks, uh, another ERISA Supreme Court update, this time on Intel versus Sulima. So just want to start with the uh, disclaimer that this is just for educational purposes. It's not for legal advice or financial advice, and all these opinions are mine. They're nobody else's. Uh, so I'm just going to hit these uh, four big cases this year for 2020. Right now we're on Intel uh, versus Sulima. I've already done the first video, Thole v. U.S. Bank. So Salima, this uh, case is about uh, the ERISA fiduciary uh, rules. So we'll 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 just jump into it and we'll we'll see what we're uh, dealing with. So starting with the overview, it's uh, uh, on petition for the Intel Corporation Investment Policy Committee. So it's basically the fiduciary committee for Intel's retirement plan, specifically the retirement plan and the 401k plan. Uh, participant Salima sued the Intel plan fiduciaries over investment selection and claimed not to have read notices and disclosures regarding the risks of those selections. Uh, the statute of limitations would normally be three years from the date of actual knowledge, but uh, if you don't have actual knowledge, then the uh, time limit is six years. So the question is, does actual knowledge require proving that a participant read the notice, or can you impute that a participant has read all notices that were properly sent. Um, so let's uh, jump a little more into the facts of the case just so you can understand what's going on. It's the Intel Retirement Contribution Plan and then the Intel 401k Savings Plan. Uh, some of the plan funds were extensively invested in alternative assets. So the funds themselves were invested in other assets and then participants could choose among different uh, funds within the 401k plan. And if you picked certain funds in the Intel plan, they would have uh, alternative investments. And that's the primary issue in this case, um, at least from Salima's perspective. That's that's Salima's perspective. He, he was alleging that the fiduciaries uh, made a mistake, that this was a failure of fiduciary duty because the assets had higher fees and they had worse performance. So uh, 2008, when the market rebounded, the assets were uh, not correlated to equity, so they didn't rise with equity. Now, the plan had fulfilled all of its normal uh, duties under ERISA to provide notices and disclosures and so forth, uh, had, allocate, had uh, provided disclosure that these were risks, that the funds were not going to behave like, like either fixed income bonds or like stock market equity. Uh, it had followed all those rules, and Salima had accessed the plan website that included those disclosures and notices. But Salima, he claimed that he did not actually have specific knowledge. He did not recall seeing any of the disclosures about the allocation or the risks. So the allocation uh, itself is one of imprudence or a failure of the ERISA duty of prudence. Uh, these alternative assets, uh, they were... They were in funds that were weighted towards both various alternative assets and then also among equities. It was a little heavily weighted international over U.S. Um, but a lot of the discussion and commentary, including the court opinion, uh, focused on, and the underlying court opinions as well, focused on the alternative assets, which were hedge funds and also commodity funds, uh, private equity as well. So it's just, it's a little unusual. Normally you see uh, a lot more of these funds will focus on stock market, traditional equities, or fixed income bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds, etc. Uh, the target date funds within the Intel plan were a fifth to a quarter hedge at various points, hedge fund uh, assets, 45% uh, commodities funds, and uh, some of them were as much as half of their actual regular equity was non-U.S., which is generally considered a little little riskier, but not per se inappropriate. None of these are automatically inappropriate, but they are riskier and they present a risk profile that's different from uh, stock market. So that's that's really what it's about. Is it's just it might not behave the way participants are expecting. So the risks should be adequately considered by the fidu fiduciaries and they should be appropriately disclosed as well. And then another investment vehicle, the Global Diversified Fund, uh, by the end of 2013, it was uh, more than a third, 
alternative assets. So with pretty significant weighting. Uh, and when the stock market rebounded, these assets are not correlated directly with, with stock, with equity. So they did not rise, but all the rest of the uh, stock market was rising. So if the funds had been invested in regular equities like the, say, the S&P 500, they would have uh, enjoyed a lot of that increase in growth. Um, and at the same time, these alternative assets like hedge funds and commodities, private equity, had higher uh, fees associated with them. So worse returns and higher fees. Um, Sulima also alleged failures of other uh, fiduciary duties. So neglect, inadequate disclosure, co-fiduciary responsibility, etc. cetera. Uh, the primary discussion is around imprudence, but uh, those were also a claim. So let's talk about the time limit because this is what the case became about. Uh, and it actually took, overtook the discussion of imprudence itself. Uh, Salima was suing, and it was more than three years, but less than six years after uh, the um, investments were made. Now, ERISA has a six-year statute of repose, which is without regard to knowledge. So that means even if you didn't know about it, there's just a six-year limit for most uh fiduciary violations. And then it also has a statute of limitations, which is three years. And that starts from actual knowledge. So there could be a situation where the statute of limitations never begins because you never had actual knowledge. Uh, but the statute of repose, the six year limit does run. So uh, those are different things. And obviously, if you are uh, on defense, if you're a planned fiduciary, you want the three year limit. You, you want a shorter amount of time uh, after which you can be sure you're not going to be sued. So the question is, how do you get that three-year limit? What's actual knowledge? How do you prove it? Do you, do you need to prove it? Is simply providing a no notice enough to uh, allow you to assume or to impute uh, that the uh, participant read the notice? If it was properly provided, why, why do you have to uh, figure it out? How, how would you even go about proving it? Um, and just on a larger level, are participants expected or required to read appropriately provided plan notices? So we, we knew the, the facts stipulated were that Sulima had visited the plan website, and that website had all, many different disclosures, fact, fund fact sheets, it had the QDIA notice, uh, it had the SPD annual disclosure package, it had other notices. Uh, there was no proof that he actually saw any of these disclosures, and he said that uh, he didn't recall them. So is that enough for actual knowledge? Can you hold the fact that they were available to, for, to him against him and assume he should have had actual knowledge and it's his fault if he didn't? So the opinion uh, came out February 26th. Alito wrote for a unanimous court, so it's a nine-zip decision. Uh, and they decided against the plan fiduciaries, against Intel, and in favor of the plan participants, or in favor of Sulima. So the unambiguous language of ERISA says actual, um, which the court said implies more than hypothetical. So uh, you can't just assume it, you can't presume it, you can't impute it, you can't just say, well, as a default, if you sent a notice, uh, therefore uh, all the participants have to uh, be treated as having read it. They were on notice. Well, that's that's not the way uh, the court interpreted the statute here. So although that might work in, in some other situations, it does not work here. The fact that notice was available and it followed all of the uh, methods required by the Department of Labor and by the Internal Revenue Service, it doesn't matter. Um, there must be actual knowledge. So you have to actually demonstrate that the participant knew something. Actual means more than presumed or hypothetical. That's at least what the court said. And so they sent it back down to district court for the fiduciary claims like prudence, whether those investments were um, a good idea at the time. So a little bit of analysis here. What, is, what does this mean? What's the immediate impact? Um, if a plan can show actual knowledge, you're going to probably get that three-year statute of limitations. Uh, but if you are unable to show it, then the plan and the fiduciaries uh, will have to rely on the six-year statute of repose. So you still get a limit. It's not unlimited in, in most circumstances, um, but it does mean actual knowledge can matter. So how can you show that? Well, the court did go into it a little bit. Uh, circumstantial evidence is allowed. There 
you can show by inference. So it's not, it doesn't have to be 100% proven. It's not absolute certainty. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt or anything like that. But there, there should be some actual attempt to prove it. So simply sending it and allowing you to impute knowledge or presume knowledge is not enough. So that might be something like an electronic record, some kind of interaction on a website uh, showing that you viewed it or you downloaded it or maybe you clicked a box or um, could be something more substantial than that, but some, some kind of evidence. Uh, and of course, the, it could even be something like if you ever want to use the planned website, uh, the portal to get to your plan investments or, or whatever, you might be, uh, for example, forced to click on a disclosure and read through it. Um, that's something that, that planned fiduciaries could resort to, just for example. Um, the court, the Supreme Court also uh, pointed out that participants are bound by oath in deposition. So Salima gave a deposition saying he didn't recall. The court said, well, he was under oath, he was, he was bound, it was a penalty of perjury, so we're going to assume it unless you have some other evidence, basically. So what about longer term commentary, uh, something a little, a little bit further than just the analysis? What does this mean in the future? How, how can you react to it as a plan fiduciary? Um, as I said before, you can take steps to actually sort of track engagement, track downloads or views, check boxes, some kind of pop-up notice that a participant has to engage with the disclosure uh, or a notice uh, before doing anything else on the website. And there, there are probably other creative solutions that uh, plans can consider. Also, those of you who are plans uh, administrators or plan fiduciary, uh, there is the new DOL safe harbor. Um, the, the regs were actually just finalized this month. They allow an opt out electronic notice and they allow you to send notices by email or SMS. So consider that uh, consider Salima and the new DOL Safe Harbor at the same time and consider ways to track engagement with notices and disclosures and, and what that might look like. This is probably an opportunity to incorporate both uh, the, the Safe Harbor and Salima. Uh, for those looking at class action uh, implications, um, the actual knowledge is individual to each participant, right? It's a separate fact. So it's possible that class actions might have trouble benefiting from Salima because each uh, participant would have to be, a, there'd be a particularized analysis for each person. Uh, so that, that could be complicated. So it's, an, it's interesting to see where that might lead. Possibly class actions will still have to hold themselves to a three year limit just for uh, practical purposes. And uh, of course, the best litigation defense as always is just uh, rigorous observance of all your regular ERISA duties, your fiduciary duties. So keep monitoring your investments, listen to appropriate experts and always try to keep fees low and try to keep returns reasonable and uh, comparable to the market. That's, that's just always what you're going to do regardless of whether you get a three year statute of limitations or a six year statute of repose. So just uh, top line takeaways, what, what does this really mean? Well, fundamentally, plan participants are just not presumed to have read an ERISA notice. You still need to send them as a plan, but they are not presumed to have read them uh, for purposes of the statute of limitations. Uh, plans should consider implementing measures uh, so that they can document uh, disclosures, so that they can show actual knowledge and, and what that might look like. Um, and of course, as I just said, the best way to prepare for any type of litigation is, is just to be a good faithful fiduciary, try and fulfill uh, those uh, fiduciary duties the best way you know how. So those are the uh, uh, cases that I'm gonna try to cover for 2020. We've gone through Thole and now Salima, gonna go through Putnam and Yonder and uh, see what we can, can make of those. Those two are interesting because uh, they are they are not opinions in the same way Salima and Thole are, but I think they are gonna end up being um, significant nonetheless. So this is uh, obviously something that's only going to matter directly to a limited number of people. But for those of you who are paying attention to this space, this is actually fairly important uh, for planning purposes. If you're in litigation, this is something that will matter to you. Um, but if you are an actual fiduciary, you should absolutely be aware of this and you should be considering ways to track knowledge. You should be considering ways to improve disclosures and notices. But ultimately your mission is still the same, which is to do the best fiduciary job that you can. 
So that's that's ultimately still where we are, is regardless of whether you're stuck with a three-year or six-year limitation for fiduciary claims under ERISA, you still want to avoid giving any cause. You want to minimize the risk that claims can be asserted against you. So um, keep doing your training, keep uh, considering all the stuff your experts have to tell you, and keep following all that uh all the advice that your your advisors and experts are giving you, and that's always going to be the best way to proceed. So I hope this was helpful. I'm going to go through those other two cases, uh, and uh, I hope uh, I I hope uh, you appreciate this advice. Thanks.